welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. My name is Lüning, Horst Lüning, and no, he is not my son Ben. <laughs> he is virtually on the other side. Uh, I'm not in the office, I'm in Berlin. I have something uh, to do here, and so I have to be transferred from Berlin to our company and from there to YouTube and then all around to you in the world. Yes, uh, hello and welcome from me as well. And today we are talking about the lowlands. And um, we have a number of lowlands distillery here in front of us. And if you keep uh, track of our channel or if you visit whiskey.com slash live, you always see that there are a lot of tastings coming up and um, we announced these tastings beforehand so maybe you have the chance to get one of these bottles where you live and it's always much more fun if you try these bottles while you watch the video with us and you have the whiskey with us so um hello to the chat is i haven't seen anybody in the chat yet is the chat uh, the right one yes probably uh, oh yeah, great to be here with you, Ben and Horst. Yeah, great to be with you as well. Uh, yeah, so um, we're having three distilleries. The Glasgow 1770 is a very, very young distillery or a very, very old distillery, depends on how you look at it. And then we have the Ockentoshan, the well-known whiskey for their triple distillation. And in the end, we have the Bladnock, which is uh, also a very young one, but also has a bit of heritage. And this whiskey is not from their recent opening, but uh, from the time before. And yeah, since 2019, the Bladnock distillery is now visit visitable and uh, they have now a visitor center. But unfortunately, due to the virus there have not been many people visiting uh, the distillery so i did uh or we thought a little bit about the sequence we will have this whiskies um today and well, the first one is definitely the one which is the youngest so we decided to have the 1770 as the first and then we weren't quite sure should we take the open toshin uh, three wood as the second or the black knock samsara as the second and uh, well because the ontoshin has so many casks in which it matures um, but it's uh, triple distilled we come to that later and uh, this leads to a smoother alcohol so we decided to have that a second and it's 43 percent abv and so we moved the Bladnock Samsara with the 46.7 ABV uh, and uh, the double distillation whiskey to the last one. So we think we have that sequence. Probably uh, you might change the second with the third. Uh, yeah, that depends on what you like, uh, what you think would be the best. Okay. Um, I think we've talked about enough about the whiskies. Let's talk about a little bit of about Scotland and where these whiskies come from. They come from the lowlands. And the lowlands are the one here in orange from the very south of Scotland. And yeah, the white here down in the very, very south, that is the border to England. And we're looking now at the northern border to the highlands. That is very interesting to, to know what is the fiend, uh, defined as highlands and what is defined as lowlands. So you've already uh, talked about the, the line quite a bit. Where does it start? Where does it end? Yeah, uh, the line is typically said to be a line between G uh, Greenock, that is on the southern shore of the Clyde, which is uh, the saltwater lock moving uh, into Glasgow uh, and there's some some tens of miles to the west of Glasgow that's the starting point and then we're moving up to the northeast to Dundee which is on this uh, uh, map visible they're just at the border between the orange and the red one uh, red area uh, and that is typically said to be uh, the border between lowlands and highlands, but it's not a straight line. 
it's a spline it's it's not a a, a straight so uh, well there is some history behind that and i think you have a little bit more of background information yes. Uh, because that is now the geographic definition of lowlands. But uh, back in the days, it was much more yeah, interesting to uh, because uh, lowlands and highlands had different legislation, something that is unthinkable today that we have some parts of the country that are allowed to do something and some parts are not. Um, in the lowlands, it was legal to distill whiskey and in the highlands, it wasn't. But the lowlands and highlands were not the lowlands and highlands nowadays, geographically. But the taxation um, region was different from the geographical one. And here we see the taxation region of the lowlands. And it goes far, far up north to the north coast of the space side. So um, it was actually allowed to distill there because the taxman had a ship and they shipped, they sailed up uh, the coast and then they landed there and collected the taxes. But they couldn't go in too far to the inlands. So it was unable, to, yeah, it was just too high and too uh, hilly and everything. So that's where they defined as the highlands and you didn't uh, pay any taxes there. So, uh, for alcoholic distillation and so you actually weren't allowed to distill at all but that had yeah a lot of implications because people were just fed up with it and just distilled anyways and so they were smuggling it in barrels and little casks and quarter casks and everything and over the years in the lowlands the technology rose and production rose a lot. You have something about the coffee still there? Yeah, so uh, it wasn't allowed in the highlands because there wasn't a, a train running there. So it was just by a carriage and, and steep or, or mule. So it wasn't very feasible to collect taxes up there. So it was only allowed in the lowlands. And sorry about the picture going out now. Uh, it's my camera, which isn't able to uh, hold through that long. And uh, so it was only allowed in the lowlands. And there uh, people made some in, in innovations. Uh, there was a guy called Ineas Coffee, and he invented the coffee still. And the coffee still uh, is a, a continuous still. And this continuous still... Uh, was able to produce a lot of alcohol, but a, a minor alcohol. And they s increased production, increased production that went down in quality. So it was lowland and bad whiskey. Yeah. And then the king, I think, Edward, the something, do not remember very well. Uh, he, when he came to Edinburgh, from, from London to Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, he said, bring me one of the good stuff from the Highlands. So the king himself was illegal, but who cares, he's the king. And uh, then he said in 1823, well, fed up, just enough. Uh, now distilling the Highlands is legal. And therefore you see all the distilleries from 1823 and 1824 uh, being legalized but you need a license. So you had to apply for the license and you had to pay money for the license. And so uh, when they were able to sell that malt whiskey to the major towns, uh, they had an advantage and all the small distilleries, the illegal distilleries stopped production because uh, it was economically better to have uh, malt whiskey, legal malt whiskey. And so everything moved to malt whiskey. Yeah. And also what uh, was more problematic was the lowland whiskey uh, was still considered uh, less good than the highland whiskey. So all the lowland whiskey went downhill and a lot of distillery closed and even later they closed. So there were not many distilleries left in the lowlands. So there are, if you look at a map where all the distilleries lie, they all lie in the highlands and not in the lowlands. And yeah, 
So nowadays we only have a handful of distilleries left and we're looking at these distilleries today. Enough about the taxes and there was a question about uh, did they tax the islanders? Yes, they did tax the islanders and you were allowed to distill on the islands because um, Great Britain was an empire of ships and taxmen had access to ships. Uh, yeah, but let's sorry, talk about sorry to interrupt. This wasn't Great Britain. This was the United Kingdom. Ah, United Kingdom. Yeah, Great Britain is the island and the United Kingdom is the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the island um, together with the, with the islands. Yeah, but uh, we've already talked about Edinburgh, which is one of the big cities in the lowlands. And now we're talking about Glasgow. This is Glasgow. And in Glasgow, it's uh, yeah the dense, most dense populated area in Scotland. It has about 600,000 inhabitants. The last census was in 2011 and then they had a little bit uh, below uh, 600,000. Maybe they are already above them. Um, we don't know. Uh, but slowly the distilling is coming back to Glasgow. Glasgow didn't have any distilleries left, but now the 1770 distillery is coming back. They opened in uh, 2014 and um, yeah, the distillery was the first distillery to be founded since 1902. Yeah, and what is also very interesting about the distillery, uh, the 1770 distillery is it was the first licensed distillery of Scotland. So um, this is a lot of heritage there. Unfortunately, the distillery was closed in the beginning of the 20th century and they, I think they sold everything and dismantled it. So there was not really much left and they built in brand new stills and yeah, they're still playing a little bit with the heritage, although it probably doesn't have much to do with the old distillery back in the, uh, from the 1770 distillery. Um, yeah, so this is the distillery and now let's have a look at what we have in yeah, the whiskey. Yeah, the first whiskey is the 1770 Fresh and Fruity and this is uh, sold in a 0.5 liter bottle, so a little bit smaller than the typical 0.7 or 0.75 in the US. And uh, this is because in the startup of a distillery, you typically do not have that many uh, casks filled. So the supply is still small. So you try to, to bottle smaller bottles so that everybody is able to get one. So look out for those. They are not very popular still. And uh, it's a whiskey matured and then finished in an ex-bourbon barrel. Uh, or no, it's ex bourbon barrel and then finished in fresh oak. I think that's what that's the way they did it. And it's non-chill filtered, non-colored, 46% strength. So is that everything uh, a good whiskey should have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have some delay between ourselves. Uh, so it's not that easy to uh, to switch over from one to another. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a wonderful, nice, fresh and fruity whiskey. You do realize it's a it's a young one, so there is a bit of a a pear in there. So the pear is usually from the the raw spirit. If you have a a pear whiskey, a uh, 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 a new make from a distillery that has a lot of peer character in there. A little bit in there, but it already has a lot of uh, flavors from um, what is it, plums and a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of toffee. And you do realize there's a lot of cask in there as well and uh, a lot of fresh cask. Yeah, and I do have uh, a little or I feel the 46% ABV. So the strength of the alcohol 
is stronger than the already acquired taste from the casks. This might be uh, uh, reduced a little bit by adding water, then typically the more fruity characters uh, arise. And I do have red berries, pears as well, but, but already toffee and vanilla, and that's probably due to the uh, finish in fresh oak casks. Yeah, mm. so it's a pleasant, fresh, fruity, in the back, of course, malty character of that whiskey. I know the plumber as well. No, not the plumber, the plumber. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hans, uh, Georg Hansen, it's minty. Uh, Tom Blass, a bit chilling in the nose. That's the cooling factor in the nose, yes. And I find this is probably the 46% ABV. And uh, the minty might be some remembrance of mint uh, due to this 46% ABV. Yeah, we have a little bit of echo on, on Horst's side. That's because um, I have to understand him as well. So we get him through my microphone and through the internal channel. So there's a little bit of echo in there. Hmm. I like it. Yeah. Cheers. So, cheers. Hmm. Now it really builds up. It's strong. It's massive on your tongue. There's marzipan in it, some cookies. That's probably the, the maltiness. Some honeycomb. Yeah. Some honey sweetness, probably. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's really full flavored and quite has some kick to it. Okay, it has 46% ABV. It's very sweet and a very fresh fruity, even a little bit tropical fruity. In the German stream, we had someone who said, yeah, passion fruit. I, I more with the grapes and a little bit of honey and a little bit of Maybe, what is that? Maybe a little bit of honey melon. Hmm. Definitely, they know how to work it. And it, you still have to remember, it's a relatively young whiskey. I don't know if it's already from the vintage 2014 or 2015. So there is no metallic youthness in that. There's probably a little bit of uh, more distillery character than the cast character in it. Uh, so it, it shows it's a little bit younger, uh, but it shows already very good uh, potential yep. for the next. We have uh, Tom Blass. A bit like pear and apple calvados over fresh waffles. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, Georg Hansen, raisins, a bit of clover. Mm -hmm, okay, you have a bit of a stronger impression there than I do. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. I think, yeah, it's over the edge of being... Uh, a very young whiskey. It's still a, a young whiskey, but it's uh, it's um, enough matured young whiskey with fresh, yeah, and fruity tones. Yeah, now they call it fresh and fruity. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting influenced by the the marketing slogan there, <laughs> but I like it. It's a it's a wonderful starter. I'm really excited about what they will bring out in let's say 2024 or 2025. How is it? 10 year old expression from that distillery. Mm. I'm really, really excited about that. Yeah, that's that's a bit of a summer whiskey. Yeah, and we're now going into autumn, so mm, maybe that. Um, anyways, um, let's talk about more of the lowlands as the topic for today. And uh, the lowlands is always said to have triple distillation, 
So anything about you comments from you there? Yeah, Lowlands nope. triple distillation. <laughs> so triple distillation was necessary in former times because you fired the stills by either a coal or peat open fire and uh, that wasn't that easy so temperatures weren't that stable and you had to distill better and what's better than twice distillation triple distillation but uh, if i'm looking into the highlands then i see more distilleries in the highlands with triple distillation than in the lowlands with triple distillation in the moment i remember three maximum four uh, distilleries in the lowlands which have triple distillation yeah mm -hmm. mm. But how many distills are there? Uh, still, uh, this distilleries are there in the uh, lowlands. There are only a yeah, handful of them. So there are a lot of new ones built, but yeah. a lot of them aren't ready to to bottle whiskey at all. So they're just up in the starting, uh, and others build double distillation because probably it's cheaper, and only a very very few keep to that old triple distillation scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me talk you about into triple distillation. Some of you who have seen distillery videos of mine have already seen a lot of double distillation. I've covered about a few of them who have triple distillation. Um, most of them were like half triple distillations and where some of it was double distilled, some of it was triple distilled. Here at Ochentorschen, everything is triple distilled. And it's it starts as a beer, as the wash, and that comes into the wash still on the very, very right side of this picture. And is yeah distilled very rapidly as every wash still is doing the same. So it's nothing strange about this wash still. It comes off with about 20% ABV and uh, the rest that is still water, uh, that is the pot ale that is being yeah uh, uh, pumped out at the bottom and then it enters the intermediate still and the intermediate still is already a spirit still so you already divide between the uh, four shots the hearts and the feints and in the end you don't distill as fast and um, as high as you do in the other distilleries in the double distillation so you end up with an intermediate spirit, what's, that's what they call it, of about 54% ABV. Yeah, it also has a range uh, like the spirit still in the double distillation. And in the end, the recycled material and the intermediate um, whiskey or the intermediate is then inserted into the spirit still. And that's the final distillation. Uh, that ends up then in the uh, new make and in this final step we distill it also like a spirit still with feints four shots uh, four shots hard piece and uh, feints and yeah here you see the spirit safe and you can see this spirit safe is a bit longer than the usual spirit safe and that's because you have a few more connections to another pot still. On the very, very left, you have the sample where you can uh, put uh, the output of the distillery of the stills in a, in a beaker. And in the beaker, there is a temperature thermometer and also a um, density measurement device. And from that, from the temperature and the density, you can calculate what percentage of alcohol you have at the current moment. And from there, you can tell where you put the cuts of the hearts, the four shots and the feints. In the second uh, compartment, where you read intermediate distillate, is what comes out of the intermediate still. And there you can switch between uh, three glass bowls at the bottom. And these three glass bowls end up in the tanks for the four shots, the hearts and the feints. And in the middle, there is one bowl that the spirits uh, st distillate and the intermediate still uh, shares. And I think that is then the feints that are being distilled again. Um, yeah, above the spirit, you see another um, connection device that uh, distributes uh, the spirit still. And on the very, very right side, you can see the um, 
the wash still and that glass is always a bit tainted with a bit of a yeah, black taint because it's being burned so fast and there are bits in there that can actually burn and uh, that come through the still and taint the glass a bit uh, black. Nonetheless, uh, it doesn't really matter. What you want to see there is that it flows, that the spirit still is working. If it doesn't flow, you might have some blockage anywhere and that might build up some pressure and that might become really dangerous. Um, Triple distillation is used to distill it a bit higher and you already said, yeah, it uh, distills it a bit finer. And the thing is, uh, back in the days, um, when the, with the old Ockentoshan still uh, distillery, that's one of the pictures of the Ockentoshan distilleries, um, all the stills were uh, fired directly in all the distilleries and all the highlands they fired with peat on the islands they fired with peat and then there came coal but that you really have an uncontrollably uncontrolled fire below you still it's really really hot and you can easily uh, put too much fire in it and when you have three stills you can really stretch it out and have more quality control and that means back in the days when you had direct firing you triple distillation was kind of the only way to get a finer spirit so you had a lot of lot of rough whiskies back in the days and the triple distilled whiskies they were the ones that were the exception and were smoother and finer distilled and weren't that rough around the edges and um, yeah, let's try about what a modern triple distilled whiskey can do. And that's the Orkintoshan three wood here. So in the meantime, <laughs> my accumulator in the camera uh, <laughs> works a little bit again. I hope that I'm able uh, to do that. Uh, come through till you bring the next pick. And so now we're going to the Orkintoshan. Uh, three wood, and this is a 43% ABV, triple distilled, as Ben said, uh, and heftily matured in different casks. And uh, we have, have approximately a maturation of 10 years in ex bourbon casks, then a finish for two years, two long years in Oloroso sherry casks, and then a final maturation period of six months in Pedro Jimenez casks. And Pedro Jimenez is also a sherry, but that's a sweet sherry. The wine for that sherry wasn't fully fermented so that there is a residual sugar in it. And uh, this leads to a little bit more sweetness uh, in that sherry. And for six months, this should bring the sherry from the staves into the whiskey. So you might have this sweetness in it. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is massive this is extreme cast influence a lot of sherry a lot of fruitiness dark fruits brown sugar oranges raisins and a little bit of of nuttiness yeah okay yeah the the smell is really really sweet it's a very sweet one i can't remember that it was so sweet from the last time i tried it but it's a a wonderfully round whiskey with a lot of sweetness but also some darker notes some orange orange juice orange peel some raisins a, lo a lovely sherry aroma very lovely sh sherry yeah. aroma so I find the oranges as well, together with this massive sherry tone on top of that. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Shall we have a try? I know Tom Blass has it in his glass and he says he gets diabetes from the PX smell. Yep, it's, it's very, very sweet. Yeah, cheers. Cheers.
yeah now the orange character is much more in the front the hazelnuts the nuttiness from the sherry cask is there the alcohol is very very smooth like a like a really old one so if you distill very high to high abvs then this uh, typical uh, oiliness is going away you have a much lighter uh, more natural or uh, yeah alcohol and that leads uh, to a smoother feeling in your mouth so you feel those cherry casks a lot stronger than with other uh, whiskies the oranges is what is left over from the distillery character yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very very in intense it has a a lot of sweetness, a lot of nuts, a lot of fruits in it, a lot of cherry character. Mm, I really love it. And it's wonderfully smooth. Can't really say or tell that it's from the triple distillation, but it's um, it's the sum of it. And it's a very well-made whiskey, and it's not priced that high. So this is a, a good value for money whiskey, I have to say. And I would recommend it. Maybe not the first whiskey you introduce a beginner to, but the second one. And also it's a very nice whiskey to have it in the evening just to relax when the whole day is over and you just lean back and enjoy. Mmm. Mmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm. Oh yeah. There's yeah. Some of a now we have in the chat. some grams, <laughs> some sipping uh, in it, in us. Uh, so the taste is really building up. Mm -hmm. Feel the casks in the aftertaste. Mm -hmm. It's not staying that long. If you have a few sips, it's staying a little bit longer. But um, it's. It's a, yeah, maybe it's a medium finish. But um, I want to continue about a bit more about the journey through um, the lowlands. And we have already talked about the taxes in the lowlands. We've talked about the city in the lowlands or the cities, Edinburgh and Glasgow. And we've talked about the desolation. And now let's talk about the countryside. And yeah, the, the barley that is grown for the whiskey is mostly grown in the lowlands and yeah the big maltings are also in the lowlands crisp maltings braid maltings pancake land or pancake land southeast of edinburgh so these are the big maltings and they do get the the barley and they bring out the malt for the beer and for the whiskey and just to give you a feeling of how much uh, barley is grown in Scotland in 2014, it was um, 2 million tons of barley. That is 10 times the amount that was grown in 2014. But still, there is a, a lot of whiskey being made in, the, uh, in Scotland and they still need a lot of imports from Germany, uh, the Czech Republic, or other Euro uh, Eastern European states, as barley is grown there really, really well. And also, north of Dundee, just north of Dundee, are also two big uh, maltings. And if you remember from the beginning, yeah, that is now regionally seen as the highlands. But back in the days, uh, taxation-wide, it was the lowlands, so that's where they did the maltings. But also, very, very back in the days, all the distilleries did their own maltings. But yeah, the maltings are very, very close to the lowlands or lie within the lowlands. Now to give you a, a little bit of an estimation, 75% uh, of Scotland is being farmed. 75% uh, of a country being farmed is quite a lot. But uh, you think about where do they do the farming? Do they, they have the highlands. What, 
is there not just a Highlander going through with this sword and, and that's it? No, uh, 50% <laughs> is being used uh, for farming with uh, sheep and cattle. So, uh, and the other, and 20 25% of Scotland is uh, for growing wheat or other grains. So, yeah, we've talked about a lot about the barley and the grains. And um, let's talk about a bit about the, yeah, the cattle and the sheep. And um, this is the first uh, inhabitant of the highlands, uh, the highland cattle, a very long haired cow. And they really look really, really nice because they have so much hair growing into their eyes and they look a bit like, yeah, like an emo. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to give you uh, some hints about that. Uh, we have friends in Lower Bavaria, and they have a herd of, of cows and and a bull, and they are looking so friendly and and so huggy. But that bull, he's four times the size of this cow, and he's really strong, and he does not like people. <laughs> so don't go too close to those high island cattle. They yeah. might be dangerous. Yeah, and if you look at the horns, um, they do look really dangerous. And uh, <laughs> yeah, be aware of cows. Cows are cows are really heavy, and if they want to play with you, then you get the short end of the stick. And yeah, but the next animal is also really, really famous for Scotland. It's the linton, or here you see the lintons. And they're also known as the blackface sheep. Yeah, so they're really iconic. And I think they are, um, yeah, they are known for Scotland and they go all over the highlands. And the sheep is a uh, um, animal that can survive the very, very cold winters that you have in the highlands. And yeah, you can farm them on any hill because yeah, Jake can just walk up the hill, walk down the hill and eat all the grass that is grown there. And funny side note, uh, when you eat uh, sheep in Scotland, you should eat mint sauce because yeah, it's customary. But at one point of time, it was actually mandatory because um, they wanted to have more wool and they were fed up that all the farmers were actually eating their sheep because they wanted to eat meat. Uh, so they said, okay, now you have to uh, eat uh, the sheep with mint sauce and that's really disgusting nobody is gonna do that and we're gonna have much more wool because nobody's gonna eat the sheep unfortunately the scottish people grew, grew a custom of the mint sauce and now it's part of the yeah british culture to eat something with mint sauce and yeah everybody else that didn't go through that time where everybody got accustomed to the mint sauce. I think it's really disgusting <laughs> because a mint sauce doesn't taste good. <laughs> okay, but um, they're not just animals in the lowlands. There are also rivers. And here you see a river called the mm. Blatnock River. And it's at the very, very south of the lowlands. And ends up in the Atlantic Ocean and next to the Bladnock River is the Bladnock Distillery you see here on the left and that's what leads us to our last whiskey. Bladnock was uh, founded in 1817. It was closed many times, opened many times and also it got new stills. Um, the production was continued until 2009 and the distillery was uh, in silent mode until 2011 when it was then mothballed. So it was completely shut down. When was this picture taken? Um, this, I think, was taken in 1995 uh, when oh. I first visited Bladnock. And there they were in a, in a shutdown prior to a mothballing period. Uh, the stills look really bright and shiny. Have a look at this reflux bowl and the junction to the pot still below. We will see that on the next picture. Now that changed a little bit. And look at the line arm going downward and have that uh, condenser on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
And what they did is uh, they opened it, they closed it. And in 2017, they reopened it again, started production, but they actually changed the stills. And they now have four stills. They have a bit of a different shape. And also they changed the style of the distillery. In the back in the days, Bladnock was said to be the um, the Isla of the Lowlands, so said to be rough and yeah, a strong uh, distillery character. And now they want to go a bit more into the easy style of the Lowlands. And what they did is they actually got someone who is really experienced. And they got Dr. Nick Savage. If you keep close attention to this channel here, um, I've already interviewed Dr. Nick Savage at McAllen. Yes, he was the former guy at McAllen for the cask selection. And now he is their master distiller of Baladnock. Yeah, so probably I may add a little bit to that, to the uh, 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 form of the stills. Uh, the Spirit stills are in the back. You see the slightly bigger, bigger formed reflux bowls, and then this uh, cylindrical uh, intermediate to the pot. So it might be a little bit uh, more reflux in that. And have a look at the line arm. It's not uh, falling down, but uh, goes over evenly, uh, horizontally. So it's not the way that in the moment when the alcoholic vapor rises over the top, then they fall immediately down and will lead to this strong, intense flavor. Uh, but now uh, they have the chance to go back to the stills and have, uh, well, uh, being redistilled more. So the alcohol uh, coming out of that still is even a little bit uh, lighter and will remember a little bit more to the normal triple distill distilled lowland style even when it's a double distillation. Mm -hmm. So um, what we're having now is uh, the Bladnok Samsara. Um, the Samsara, if you, you've you already had it, um, is actually a whiskey that was for before 2017. And um, 2017 was a time when they filled their first casks. Um, yeah, the Samsara is... Uh, a mixture between bourbon and Californian red wine cask. That sounds really, really interesting. Because you usually you have French wine or some sweet wine or strong wine, fortified wines every corner. But I've never heard anybody with Californian wine. Yeah, I would have suggested that they use uh, Australian wine because the proprietor now of Bladnock is an Australian entrepreneur and he invested that lot of money into the new distillation and the distillery. And uh, so bringing over caps from California with these uh, heavy wines uh, isn't a, that bad idea. So you have American white oak, which is quite pleasant to your tongue. And you have this intense uh, red wine. So mm -hmm. doing a finishing in that uh, intense wine cast might not be that bad. I had that Samsara already two years ago or one and a half years ago. And uh, be careful. Uh, you can't compare that first video I took with this smell we now find in it because uh, they have batches from year to year. Um, which they feel they do not have that many casts, only a few thousand of them. So the the warehouse isn't that full, so they have to, to start carefully. And uh, next year, the 10-year-old Bladnock will be out. So they have to move to the 11-year-old, and there the casts are even rarer. So look out for those bottles if you like to have one. Uh, there might be some years where the amount of whiskeys might be not that high in volume. Mm -hmm. Oh, ha oh. ha. Yeah. So this is a concentrated, full, fruity, with an orange note, not that juice orange, but 
orange blooms, probably a little bit to the bergamot oil, concentrated, did I say that? Yes. Fruitiness, vanilla, and plums. Yeah, plums. Mm -hmm. It's very fruity and juicy, I have to say. Yeah, it's juicy and sweet, but a little bit vanilla. And it's, it's a, a very big fruit basket with a lot of complexity. And I'd really like to know how old this is, but uh, if you look at when they produced, it must be at least a 10 year old. Yes, I think so. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Tom Blast, Blood Orange. Yeah, definitely. Fisalis, Stewed Fruit, Massive. Yeah, definitely. There's maltiness in it as well, but in the back. Yeah, and let's have a try. Cheers. Yeah, this is, I didn't say it, 46.7 ABV. I think I said it just in the beginning. Uh, Unchill filtered, uncolored, a massive one. And this one was, I think, first issued to the uh, 200th anniversary of Bladnock. Uh, it was founded in 1817, so it's already three years ago. So they might have had three batches of this Samsara. Yeah, sweet, then a little bit drier. The orange is going over a little bit to citrus notes. Vanilla. Yeah. Wonderfully done on the old pot stills you've seen in the first picture. Mm -hmm. mm. A lovely whiskey. Definitely the, the strongest today and definitely the heaviest today. But it have a, has a, a lovely mixture of uh, juiciness, that blood orange, a little bit of orange, yeah. Orange juice, blood orange uh, combined with a few grapes. Mm, combined with a little bit of oak as well. Now that it comes into the finish, there's even more oak, but it's not one of these European spicy oaks, but a uh, um, mixture between the wine flavors and uh, a pleasant American oak, I would say. Mm. Mm. Even with this 46.7, it's smooth, it's gentle, and in the aftertaste, a little bit of spiciness, probably coming from the from the wine cast, and some resins showing that there had been uh, wine in the cast before. Yeah, massive. We we thought about having this one as the second or as the third one. And we decided because it's only a double distilled whiskey to have it as the third one. And um, yes, you're right. This is definitely the strongest one here. Mm -hmm. And have those 46.7, even more than the 43 of the uh, Orientation. Uh, yeah. This was the right sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's kind of growing on me. Mm. I'm really excited about how the the new style of the Blattnock distillery is going to be. Are they mm. still going to use these heavy tones or is this a thing of the past? Mm. Only time will tell. So they, they started in 2017. They had casks. We've seen that in that picture, in the last picture. And maybe they'll bring out uh, whiskey over the next years. We will see. Yeah, definitely. They mm -hmm. have to, to, to recover the, the investments. So, and he's an entrepreneur. He knows how to, to spread the whiskey worldwide. Yeah. And yeah, to make a bit of a advertisement, this was the Lowlands region, 
The next what we're gonna do is gonna be the Isla region. And if you go to whiskey.com slash live, you will not just find all the other live streams there, you will also find the next live streams and we're gonna do a bit of a series of live streams over the next uh, weeks and months and we're trying to keep up the like three to four weeks is our is our thing but there are also going to be a few special occasions going to be spiced in so yeah i think it's the 23rd that's going to be the next one of october and uh, that's going to be again same time same place whiskey.com slash live and we're gonna have three Isla whiskeys. I think they're already over here somewhere. And yeah, we're gonna try them together. So they are a bit more common, more famous. So maybe you have some of them at home, take them out and have them with us. I hope that then in the next uh, live stream, I'll be there really in presence uh, and not over here in Berlin, uh, <laughs> sitting in a hotel room uh on a quite comfortable chair but the lighting is not that good and that's the first time we tried this mm -hmm. and uh, when the camera is working i think the quality of the picture isn't that bad uh when i have to go to the camera of the laptop then mm, i don't like that very much and uh, having those small samples uh, just gives us the chances uh, to do this uh, well remotely mm -hmm. so let's talk about the the how good was it? Let's com do a comparison. Yeah, mm, difficult. <laughs> For me, it didn't change anything about what I've tried in the first take. So I'm still going with uh, Ochentoschen Tribut, also number two, then the Blatnock Samsara, number three, and the Glasgow. So for me, I thought first the Ochentaschen would be my favorite as well, because I know that whiskey for a long, long time. But, uh, well, this time it's the Blattnach, mm -hmm. uh, because this California wine cask gives some kick and the higher ABV. Uh, well, that gives some impression, uh, which is a little bit more, well, say, Highland style. Uh, in this case, and uh, so I say three, two, and one. The uh, 1770 Glasgow uh, is a good one, shows potential, uh, but a little bit too young, does not have enough, or say uh, this big cask influence we're typically used by uh, single malt whiskies. Uh, it's fresh and fruity but I would like to have a little bit more of a cask in it. So mm -hmm. if they decide to have a finishing in cherry, port, wine cask, whatever they have, and bring out that when the whiskey is still younger, then it would be a burner. <laughs> yeah. So for you, it's three, two, one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two guys agreeing with you in the chat. I just, I just love how how well-rounded and how well-made um, the Ochentorschen was. But the Samsara is also a really good whiskey, but yeah, a bit a bit hefty, a bit strong. If you're in the mood for it, it might be my favorite as well. Mm, okay, so I think that's it for this stream today. Um, keep being posted and the 23rd of October is our next date, so... Um, if you like this video, then please feel free to give it a thumbs up. And do you have anything else? Yeah. Uh, where are the people able to find the whiskeys we're tasting in the next live stream? It's on whiskey.com slash live. There's everything written down there. Okay. So that they are able to, to get those uh, bottles. Yeah. And they are, this, this uh, next ones are pretty common. So I've seen there are already a few Isla lovers in here. So they might uh, get these whiskeys. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.